Welcome to a special mini-series where we explore the role of corporates in the regenerative transition. This series is supported by the Earthworm Foundation. Find out more in an interview we did with Bastien Sachet, the CEO of Earthworm, in the show notes below, and more information on Earthworm at earthworm.org. What role could or should one of the biggest banks in the world play in the regenerative transition? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to another episode. Today with the Senior Advisor Sustainable Business at one of the biggest banks in the world, BNP Paribas. Welcome Pierre Rousseau. Good. I always like to start with this question because I don't know if you have a farming background, but why and how did you end up spending quite a bit of time looking at regenerative agriculture and soil. Well, yes, I have absolutely no background in farming. So that's probably the right things. And uh, in sustainability and the way that we have to work around all the changes around that, there are different big, uh, large uh, team. And I think one of the team, it's about energy. I think everybody knows about it. One is about transport. And there is one large one, which is about infrastructure, buildings, and uh, efficiency that we can have around that. And one, and probably the most complicated one that we have, is around food. And food is about the production, it's about trade, it's about processing, and it's about distribution. And so, at the end, it's also about healthy food for people. So we have a full transformation, which is probably the most complex transformation that we will have here. And if we take agriculture, agriculture is a very unusual path in probably in the sustainability, the climate change and the biodiversity loss and also the inequalities of people. Because first of all, it touched the three of them very actively. So we can retrieve a lot of climate change issues. And you can see that agriculture can be one of the main reasons for the climate change, but it can be also the solution. And you have the biodiversity loss. It can be one of the main reasons of biodiversity loss and deforestation and everything around animals and domestic animals, etc., the beef. And you have also inequalities. How many farmers in the world will have to keep in mind that 40% of the production is made by small holders? So it means that it's not only big farm and the fragmentation we do have in agriculture, it's a very complex. So in banking, our main clients, uh, especially for BNP Paribas, our main clients are off takers and they have to revisit and they have to review the supply chain. And even more now that they have committed for the net zero carbon for 2050, majority of them have done that. So they will have to look at the supply chain. And so that means the model of extraction of a commodity is gone. And do you remember how you personally got like, it was there a specific moment or was it a, a gradual journey where you saw the potential and also the incredible issues or challenges of the agriculture sector? Yeah, it's one of the major, it's a gradual uh, journey because uh, we discovered that is a uh, food is key for the human beings like water. So uh, if you do not address that, you will have a tremendous disruption that will happen. And the food transformation, contrary to the other sectors, is probably the most complex because, uh, as I say, it's fragmented, number one. It's complex. The complexity is very high. And you have different models. You have the model in developing countries and you have models in uh, emerging market countries. So you have different types of models which are working around that. 
and is about one of the most important needs for the people, which is about food. And it's not only an economical issue, it's also a personal issue, a social issue, and a healthy issue about people. It's the hunger on one side, but it's also on the other side, the obesity. You know that the biggest disruption also that we do have in human beings, it's not only on the fact that we managed to reduce the hunger for many years, even it, it seems to restart again, but it's also the fact that uh, we have also created a huge problem of obesity. And obesity is a healthy issue, but at the end it's an economical issue because you have to solve the problem, the, the disease, the people who, are, who need uh, care, hospital care, hospital uh, more and more engagement to be done on the healthy side. Another big important is the social part of it, because keep in mind that the majority of the people who are producing are probably not the one that we are getting the highest level of benefit of the value chain. So very complex situation. And also at the center of a life, at the center of the economic and the social life. So it means a bank, by nature, will have to address it, whatever we like it or not. And so how are you, and, and since when, maybe uh, that's also a good question to ask for, do you remember when BNP Paribas started to seriously address this? Is it something of 20 years ago or is it much more recent? They have been always involved in the agriculture indirectly or directly because they have of taker, they have clients doing that. In some country like Poland, for instance, we have a high level of clients which are in the agriculture business. We have an operation in, a, in different countries where uh, agriculture is important. We have also very important clients which are off-takers, which are processing food, the, the big food manufacturer. So we have been always involved in financing those people. But what is changing is that we were living in a model which was a, an established linear model where we went. We had traders to extract the commodities. So we had what we call the soft commodities. And BNB Paribas has been financing these soft commodities and this model. But the model today is not valid anymore. This model will change. So why this model will change? First of all, because economically speaking, it's not viable. But more and more important, sustainably speaking, it's not viable anymore because you have created different disruption. The first disruption is about extracting a commodity somewhere. We cannot extract forever at the cheapest price without taking into account the externalities. Okay, so you cannot go somewhere and then say, I'm trying to get everything I can get at the cheapest price. Why? Because if we do that, we will not take into account the externalities. So that means the indirect impact that we will create and which will be, economically speaking, not viable on the long term. First of all, destruction of the commodities itself. Look at what's going on on cocoa, for instance. Today we have a quite higher production, but we know that the production will fall apart when we will see everything which has been destroyed, and especially by destroying the forest. The second thing that we will see is that all the poor people cannot live about it, so they will be, become migrants, so they will move. So that means you will have a population movement, and this will contribute tremendously for the high migration and what we call the climate migrants. So uh, that's the second part. It's also for the company itself. That means they will not get the security of the food that they need in order to produce. So that means if there is instability created by extracting all this, that means on the long term, if they do not stabilize the way that they get the food into the factories in order to produce the food, they will not secure it. So the, consequently, their business model will die on the long term. And do you see that, that they, these extractive business models and companies, that they because I think almost everyone in listening to this sees the issues with that and sees it's crumbling. But do you see that in these larger companies that sometimes are customers of, of BNP Paribas, do you see that sense of urgency? Like if we don't change it now, we won't secure these commodities anymore. We cannot get access to the supplies. Like it's really a, a that's a life of death situation for a company. Like you need to be able to access the cacao, otherwise you cannot make the chocolate bar. So do you see that urgency now? Yeah, you will see. And there are different solutions and it's complex. Let me explain. 
you have different ways. So first of all, if you want to secure, first of all, the people do realize that they have to face, as an agribusiness company, you have to face different issues. The first one, the security of the food that you still need to get. But also, you can get it on a different way. You can see all the alternative food which is today produced. Okay, so you can you have all this new uh, way that you can generate food from different sources. But at the end, you still need to have the plants. You still need to produce something somewhere. So you need to secure that. Number two, if you want to secure on a place, you need to have a landscape approach. So that means you need to make sure that you do not destroy everything there. If you destroy the soil where it's produced because you ask the people to produce, extracting too much from the soil, using too much fertilizer, a chemical fertilizer, not paying properly the people, etc., you will not secure your landscape. And by not securing your landscape, at the end, you will not secure your commodities or your resources that normally you need. So you need to stand and to have an approach where, okay, when I do something, I need to make sure that there is no deforestation. I need to make sure that the way we produce is properly done. The, the fairness to remunerate everybody along the supply chain, okay? Traceability, because I need, at one stage, I have a consumer who will ask me, by the way, where your food is coming from? Oh, all this has been produced. Is it healthy? Can I trust you? Can you show me? Even soon, is it carbon intensive? Yes or no? So the people, I think we need to wait a few years about, uh, today you have already codes, you know, under the food package. We'll show you if it's healthy or not. Very soon you will have code who say, is it produced with high intensity of carbon? Yes or no? And very soon you, what you will have, if it's fully biodiversity compliant. So more and more, we will have to have this journey, which is under the pressure of the consumer, who will tell you what kind of food they would like to have. And so what's the role of the bank, like yourself in that transition, helping your customers? So we need to help them to do the transition. This is where we are. First of all, we finance those guys. So we do the trade finance. So we already help them doing the business as they do today. But tomorrow, we will have to help them to do the transition that they have to do. So that means the bank will, as we are financing them, or as we are providing the cash in order for them to do the business, even they own the cash. It's not necessarily consequences to a lending. It can be also the way we help them to do the operation and the trade finance. So we will have to make sure that we are helping them to do this traceability. We're helping them to make sure it's not coming from a non deforest it's coming from a non deforestation zone. Why? Because also the civil society will ask us as a bank to make sure that we are financing the right purpose people or we are providing services to the right purpose people. Okay, so we have a role to play there as providing assistance to our clients in order to provide properly the services that they will have to do. And do you have an example of that transition or a transition? You say we will, but for sure you're working with a number of them already on some of the transitions. Yeah, yeah, I can give you an example. For instance, we did a transaction three years ago with Michelin. It's not directly about food here, but it's about agriculture. It's rubber. Yeah. It's rubber. So it's natural rubber. It was a plantation in Indonesia, uh, 88,000 hectares. Okay, so that's quite sizable. So. What they wanted to do, they wanted to make sure that there will be no deforestation. So Michelin had a joint venture there with a the plantation, and they wanted to make sure that uh, there will be no more problem of deforestation. And half of the land will be dedicated to do a tropical forest maintenance because it was good to keep the tropical forest and the animals and the wild animals living there. So they cut it in two, and they tried to optimize the plantation in one side, they create a village, they provide job for 16,000 people in that project. And at the same time, they also allocated some finance in order to make sure that the protection of the forest will remain there and there will be zero deforestation of that area. But also making sure that the wildlife can continue and be renovated because today, even a tropical forest, you need to maintain it in order to maintain it in its own function because, as you know, the climate change 
being there, you have also a lot of impact on the nature itself to create problem on climate change. So they were the maintenance of the forest. They were also providing job, and there were techniques that will be used in agro in terms of uh, agriculture in order to make sure that they can do the best plantation with the best productivity, but also with a lot of condition, minimalizing the use of water, working on the soil to make sure the soil will not be destroyed, using different techniques. So that's the kind of example. So if Michelin wants to finance everything in this transition through the balance sheet, they will never be able to do that. So that's why we create a blended finance model in order to do that. So we issue a bond, a several a bonds which has a structure bond with different maturity. And we guarantee that bond by a, a DFI, uh, which was US head. And then what 30% of the total size, and this could be bought by an institutional investor who has been uh, investing in that project. And at the same time, we knew that a lot of condition has been put in place in order to issue that bonds, which were a risk return, but also an impact. And so the impact were measured, no deforestation, usage of a certain number of products, the need also to trade fairly the population and the workers, etc., etc., etc. And do you see that Michelin took it to others places as well, or did it stay one pilot, or did it spread? The project is a phase one. There will be a phase two, so this will be extended. We didn't make any other project like that because to make a project like that, it's also important where you need to align the off-taker and the plantation or the people. So. And you need also to agree on the offtake agreement on the long term. And it's still very difficult to do that. But it's coming. I do believe now that you have a lot of uh, offtakers who have taken this uh, net zero commitment on carbon, that they will have to make sure that the supply chain is properly maintained. So that means there will be more and more projects that they will have to take care of. But they cannot take care by financing through the balance sheet or directly through a traditional capital markets transaction. Why? Because the shareholder will never say, I cannot pay for everything. I cannot pay to redo everything. But we can put structure in place when we are day risking with blended finance, this type of transition. So it's really to finance the transition. And when the transition is down, then after that, the practice can go back again with the right level of production. And then after that, as soon as this transition is done, you will be able to operate normally and normally with a better productivity. And at the same time, making sure that the people are fairly paid, probably also by taking into account the environment that you have in terms of biodiversity. So the only problem we have and why finance is important is that you have to finance the transition. You have to come with a solution to finance the transition. And do you see that as a, because you're saying between lines, basically the productivity will increase after the transition. Do many people agree on that? Because there's still, a, I constantly see that, I wouldn't say myth, but people like, like the productivity, if you're taking care of the soil, if you're doing regenerative agriculture practices and approaches, and many people don't believe that the productivity could be the same or higher. What have you seen in the field, literally, in this case in rubber, but also elsewhere? What have you seen with these large companies in the transition? There are two things. First of all, when you have projects like that, you have to stop to think only about the pure project of producing something out of the soil or out of the biodiversity. You need to think too about your environment. You have to think about the overall environment. You have two ways to increase. First of all, you will increase the productivity definitely of what you produce. Okay. So if you pay attention to it, if you focus on it, you will create in the area where you are more and a better quality than you had before. I'm not an agronomist and I will not tell you why people can tell you that. But what I will tell you as a finance person, if we think in landscape, first of all, we will also value the waste. We never value the waste of the agriculture in the past, or a little bit sometimes when people have animals, etc. But we can even value much better the waste and the biomass that we do generate, depending in which country we are. You can get paid for biochar. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can do biochar if you do a, a mechanism of uh, the biochar and you want to transform. But you can even transform in electricity your biomass. 
You can make methane, you can make uh, electricity directly. So it means that the first things that you can take, and even if you have a land, you can have your solar panel there on your land, or you can have a wind system. And you know, in Japan, we have seen farmers starting to have solar panel and a wind farm and starting producing the electricity for the entire region where they were. <laughs> and they become the main source of electricity in some region. So they can have another job. They can have another role that they can play that there was not a play before. So it's another source of revenue, generating electricity for your own purpose, but also for the grid. I guess you can sell it to the grid after. It's a revenue which is extremely stable, especially when you are in agriculture, when your revenue are not stable. So that's number one. The number two, the farmers themselves, they need to rethink about, especially in the developed countries, they need to rethink about the endowment. So we need to relook on the, do we need to have, maybe do we need to own the land? Maybe we can rent the land. Maybe we can lease the, the capex. Maybe we need to rethink also on the way that the farmer is in debt. And that's very important. Which is a huge issue. Most, I mean, the indebtedness of farmers. Yeah, but that can solve a lot of things. So imagine now the combination where you have a better productivity after the transformation of your soil. You have additional revenues. You have a better structure in order to, to finance your uh, operation, okay? So all this is a positive. And on top of that, we can also give you part of the alternative, uh, the externalities that you have, like the carbon. Because what you will do, you will sequestrate more carbon also when you will do regenerating farming or agroforestry. And part of that need to get back to you because you will be the maintenance of that carbon capture. And the carbon capture being valued, part of it will come back to the farmer because he's maintaining. It's thanks to his work that normally we will capture more. I'm not talking about avoidance of carbon. I'm talking about more carbon being captured in the soil or in the agroforestry when you have an agroforestry. But even more, we will come with biodiversity credit because by contributing not only to avoid biodiversity loss, but on top of that, coming with biodiversity regeneration, so re-increasing. And this is where I was last week in Cluster to a seminar about food, and I met some of the scientist guys who are starting to work, people like Patrick Holden or Tony Simons from the ECRAF, those guys were starting to think about setting up what will be the biodiversity credit. It's much more complicated to put in place than the carbon. Which is not easy, but yeah. So. <laughs> because it's moving. It's relative. It's, you don't have the same kind of status. But today, we have data to do that. This is also the big things. We are not working like in the 16th or the 17th century or a long time ago. We have data. We have a lot of information. And we don't need necessarily to ask the farmers to provide us data. We have satellite to do that. We have a lot of data that we can extract and we can have. And if we can rely on this data, which will be extremely independent, because that will be the data that will be extracted and measured through a different system. Today, you can measure the carbon from the satellite. You can measure the capture carbon from the satellite. Tomorrow, you will be able to measure the biodiversity of your land. So it means with all those improvements that we are coming and putting in place and the scientists bringing us the solution in order to monetize, we will be able to monetize also the externalities. So it means that the total of what you have today, it's not comparable to what you used to have. Because by putting the externalities, we are adding a new component, which is valuing the work of the farmers which will change completely the way that we will measure the profitability. And this is very important. This is where we have a game changer. It's that we will have to revisit the way that supply chain are working. And there will be some disruption. We are not in the same world as we used to live in the past. We are in a world which is about this being disrupted or secular, not linear anymore. 
And so it means that this is an opportunity for the farmer to revisit the way they get finance, the way they produce, and the business model they would like to implement around their business. And there, I will not say this business model is better than this business model or better than this business model. But as an investor, you will have to see agriculture as a disruptive model and not as a copy-paste of what has been in the past. So what would you tell investors? Because it sounds, and I think we see that on the podcast very often as well, we're at the beginning of a lot of dis disruptions. A lot of things are happening already, but it really feels early in some cases, like biodiversity credits, we're talking about it and they're coming. We just don't know when. What would you, without giving investment advice, obviously, but what would you tell investors that are listening? Where should they focus their attention? Where should they look the next years? Because this is a long-term process their attention if they're interested to make investments in this space or to become more active in this space? First of all, I would like to refer, what kind of investor are we talking about? Let's say private investors, uh, larger, let's say family offices, and the ones that are also leading in many cases the impact investing world because they can move their own capital. They are very important. It's a group of investors, but this is not the majority of the money. The majority of the money sits with the asset owners. So what would you advise institutional investors that are always a bit less inclined to take risks? Yeah, they don't like risk. They don't like disruption. They don't like what is new. They don't like greenfield. So definitely those people today, those people don't have the setup. Just want to tell you something. Insurance companies, 10 years ago, in average in Europe, they were invested in private equity around 5%. Today, the average is 12%. So there is some progression happening also. The other things that we need also is to set up the frame for those people to invest, because keep in mind that we have also regulators who are setting up rules that those people have to follow. So we need also to make sure that the financial frame that we are setting up is not only covering the stability short term, but also the investment long term. Because here we're talking about investment long term. For me, it's very important that we do address not only the investor that will be the first one to run in something which will look impactful or uh, like the high network individual, the family offices. They are a good part and they're very important and foundation are also part of it. So there is a group of people who have been always in that space. But if we want to create a scale, if we want to change, we need also to bring all investors. And so it means that anyway, in any sector where you are, energy, agriculture, infrastructure, we will see this speed and this change and this transformation and this disruption happening. So we will have to live with that. And we will have to change the behavior on the way that the investors are working. It means also that in finance, we will have to stop to think only with products, but solution. So we need to come to solutions. So today in finance, we are tending to be more focused on product. It's a loan, it's a bond, it's a fund. So we have also to change and say, yeah, but we will create new type of solution, which will integrate different elements that I was not familiar with, like the day risking by using different source of money. So there we will be able to bring higher risk, which will be their risk during the transition by some mechanism. So in agriculture, it's very important to have this day risking mechanism. Liquidity, providing system of liquidity, we will allow the, the investor not to keep this for a long term, but being able to get out when there is a need to get out and to improve the liquidity of the portfolio. But also thinking about new sources of revenues, like I mentioned, the carbon, for instance, or the biodiversity, which could be seen as additionalities, the additionalities, the measurement of impact. Today, what we do miss in majority is the measurement of impact. We do not measure the impact. We are measuring a risk return, but we do not measure the impact. If we do measure the risk return and do measure the impact, and we do establish that it's a way that we need to invest with purpose, and measuring impact is much more than to be ESG. Being ESG is just the normal. Yeah, yeah it's a new normal. It's the new normal. But the impact, this is fundamental. 
And if we can start to measure the impact by creating much more carbon we capture, much more biodiversity that we do generate, this is all positive. Huh? We are not just avoiding destroying or avoiding. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a net positive. It's a net positive. If we recreate business model when we integrate that, including also impact in terms of social or much more, po my, my supply chain is now socially viable where there is everybody get a minimum revenues in the process. At the end, it will be a win to win for everybody. And this is what we are because we are creating much more value than the economical value that we do have today. And today, what's the biggest mistake we have done is that we value the carbon at zero and we value the biodiversity at zero. I don't say the people don't care about it, but we value that at zero. And the day you value it at a price, then it changed your business model. And this is where an investor will have to learn and go to the learning curve is to get out from business model where the externalities were not priced. And today we will go to business model where the externalities, which is mainly carbon and biodiversity, but I will add also the social one because the social one is as important. Water is another very important, is price. And then you will see that the people will probably build up different model that will work. And so let's talk about an example in Northern France you're very much involved in. Let's walk us through how you're putting that into place literally in a big agriculture region in Europe, in Northern France. Yeah, in Northern France, we work on a project called uh, Sol Vivant. Okay, so that's the word in French. It's again, it started at the beginning about uh, identifying farmers who want to move to regenerating farm. So no, we have to start from the beginning. What are all the constraints? So first of all, we cannot do that alone. It's not us bankers who do that. We are just an enabler, okay? But we need to put together a group of people comprising the farmers, comprising the entire ecosystem with the off-taker, so the politician, the data, the information, the data provider, the different provider of information, and of course the bankers, the, the finance. So you have science, science is needed. You have all the actors, you have technology, digital data information, and you have finance. So you have all the enablers and sometimes some technology also, because the use of technology mixed with the common sense of nature, that's the new combination that where we can create value. Then we have to study. So we need to do concept note, we need to do proof of concept, and we need to convince farmers to do the transformation. But for that, we will try to find a business model where we will look at how they can produce better. So we will look at the productivity, we will look at the cost base, we will look at the endowment, and we will put a plan to reschedule the endowment, for instance. Then after that, we will look at what kind of externalities we can play with. We can play with the carbon, we can play with the biodiversity, probably later on, it's a little bit too early, but it will come. And then we look at what are all the funding existing. You have the funding from the banks, yes, but you have also the public sector, which is there, which is providing a lot of money today, even today, by the subsidies from Europe, from the French government, from the region. Or can we mix that and rebuild the solution where we can, during the transition, which will take probably five, six, seven years, we can remunerate the farmers, we can finance the transition. What is great is that a subsidy, which is normally a perpetuity, <laughs> because when you start to pay a subsidy, you, you pay it forever, yeah. will stop here because it's only for the transition. So after that, you will stop. So you can reallocate that money to something else. And at the end, the farmers after that will be in a situation where it will be better. It will be better financially speaking. It will have a different way to produce. It will have additional source of revenues. And also we will integrate the externalities in the business model. So that means the carbon for sure, the biodiversity probably will come later on. And so what farmers are we talking about? What's the size? Because this is a large area. Oh, yeah, we start with a pilot first. So we, we start probably with a thousand of farmers. And after that is to find the right product and the right business model that we will put in place. There are many different solutions. We can end up with a securitization of their loan that we can probably list it to the market. 
That's a way that we can do it. There is another way that we can we can create a fun. We can create. A, and is this the first time that this sort of landscape approach is being put to work in France? Yeah, it's new. That's where we have to finance the transition. Here we are really in the financing of transition. But what is important is to take into account all the elements. So the collaboration between the scientists, the finance people, the different actors, the players, the off-takers, the farmers, is very important that you agree about the new model that you would like to put in place and the condition of this model. So that means the do's and the don'ts. So what you do and what you don't do. What is authorized, what is not authorized. What, what will be the new rules of engagement of the new seller? And that's very important. And this is has to be science-backed. Scientists need to say that's the way to go. That's the way that we, we're moving. It's not just a decision, an economical model where we go blinded anymore. We need to be backed up by scientists. And this is extremely important because at the end, the transparency of what you will deliver in front of the investor will be there. So it's an open book. It's not something where you, you generate revenues out of a black box anymore. It's an open book. It has to be clear. And how did you get involved in this specific region? Like what was the, the start there? What was the reason why this consortium or this coalition got together and you started working on Northern France? But first of all, it's not coming from us. Originally, as I mentioned, we are uh, an enabler. So uh, first of all, uh, it's coming from a, a non-profit organization, especially Hotworm here, who came with the project itself because they were working with some of the farmers in order to go already to make regenerating farming. It's also coming from the pressure from a certain number of off-takers, which also have the pressure from the consumer knows that the business model of tomorrow will be about regenerating farming. So those people know that this will go on one direction at one stage. And they know that uh, we will have at one stage to realize if you talk to the farmers in that region, they will tell you that they have probably in five or 10 years of cultivating potatoes or uh, the different elements, they do that. After that, they will not be able to get the same production because they have conditioned the soil is not productive enough because the, uh, if they continue on the way they do it today, it will not work anymore. The productivity will go down because they face also more and more water problems, <laughs> etc. So they have to rethink. So it came from the business and the industry itself who do realize that they have to change. The problem, why the people don't change? Because the people do not know how to do the transition. Who will pay for the transition? So this is the role of finance to come and to think about solution where we will be able to finance the transition. And what this is where it's changing also, because by using the existing methodology of different funding, the funding from the philanthropy, the funding from the public sector, the funding from the private sector, by combining private equity and probably debt, private debt, and after that refinancing together, by putting together different products and putting together a solution, including the valuation of the externalities, which is the carbon and the biodiversity, and maybe tomorrow the water, etc. By putting all this in a model, then we will start to be able to finance the transition. And then we can move from a model A to a model B. And do you see, because you're for sure you're not financing all the farmers there, how are you going to work with other banks in there that probably are financing some of them already? As soon as we have a model, every bank can finance the farmers and we apply the same model. So here it happens that we are financing some farmers, but we are not financing all of them. So by putting a, a solution in place, this solution can be applied also to other banks who are financed because... As soon as one stage, especially if we do the securitization of the loan, I can securitize the loan, whatever is issued from bank A or bank B or bank C. So I can collect it through a common pot. And in terms of risk, it will be even better because you create a diversification of your portfolio, which is even better. I really see you as a finance person. And it's fascinating to see you getting very excited about the future of farming and the future of farms and their farm financing. I'm not deciding about the future farming. I'm excited about the solution that we can find because this will allow to come to regenerating farming. 
If all the farmers can go to that, then we have the financial solution in order to accelerate them. The finance here, what is the role? Financing the transition. So this is where we help. We help to scale. We have a role to scale. We can accelerate the process because we can create the finance, the money. By putting more money, we can create an acceleration. But there is one thing you need to keep in mind here. It's only possible not because one person or one institution can do it, but because you have a collaborative, you have a collaborative solution. And the collaborative here is a key word. You need to put everybody along the same condition, the same engagement, the same rules of engagement. It means the farmers, the off taker, the cooperative, but also finance, but also the scientists and also the politician. So we need to put in place the entire setup that will bring the solution. If you don't have the politician and the regulator on board, it's very difficult to create new solution because they will still be in the world of yesterday. Subsidizing fertilizer. Yeah. yeah. So if you don't push the change, if you do not agree all to go in one direction, and here by starting pilot and after extending, that's the way to demonstrate it works. Okay. So that's the way we have to go. And then you will bring investor because investor will see that it works and then the investor will come. And then we need to attract not only the high network individual or the family offices, but the big pension fund the big insurance company, the big sovereign fund, the, the, the guy who, have, who are managing the big money. And this is where we can, in that case, create the right scale. I want to be conscious of your time and ask a few final questions just to get some other perspectives. What do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that most don't? So where are you contrarian? The first things that the people believe is that if you take into consideration nature or biodiversity, you will make less money than before. Okay, this is what the people believe. That's probably true if you look at short term and you don't take into account the destruction of the nature that you create. If we start to measure the externalities, which is the key point, this is the central point. If you measure this, then you will realize that you were wrong. And the way that you were measuring your profitability was at a short term and not long term. It was that you were not taking into account all the destruction, you, so you don't pay for what you destroy. If you have to start to pay for what you destroy, and if you start to get paid for what you create as a value, as a regenerating farming, as additional biodiversity and additional carbon capture you generate, then you are in a business model which will be much more profitable. And the problem today is that we need to finance the transition. So the people do see when they start, they, they are doing this and they have to go to another world and they say, oh my God, I need to go through five, six, seven years on transition where is an unknown. I don't know what's going on. And this is what terrifies people. But we have proof today with the pilot which has been done that when you are, and uh, there is a fantastic guy called Alan Peters from University of Leuven who have made studies about that, who can prove that regenerating farming per head is much more profitable than the industrial model. He has made all the things, and this is proven today by the scientists, okay, and the economists which look at but the problem remains, how do we finance the transition? How do we finance to move from the old model to the new model where we will value the externalities? The big driver, the big change in everything is that this is what carbon will be so important in the coming years. And this is also, and I would like to add something, this is also the risk of greenwashing. Because the people may think that they are doing the right transformation without doing the transformation and make it believing and making the investor believing on it. And then in that case, we have greenwashing. So we have to be careful that it has to come real. It has to be the real effort of transformation has to be there. And it has to be properly remunerated. And when you have a tax when you are doing the wrong things and a reward when you are doing the right things, then you will see that the model will change by itself because we will take new way to evaluating the real profitability. And more than ever, we will give a value to the nature. We will give a value to the carbon capture. 
to the biodiversity regeneration. That was going to be my, my final question, but you sort of already answered it. Like, what if you had a magic wand and you could chase one thing in the food and agriculture or also aquaculture, like the, the land use and, and CEU space, what would be that one thing? So you had a magic power, you can change one thing overnight, tomorrow morning we wake up and you had changed something. Would it be the externalities or would it be something completely different? The problem is that for me, the externalities is the key point. Huh? As you mentioned, you probably heard about it. The problem is that it's always, it's in the accounting, in the accounting model. And the accounting model is always the last one that we change. So today we need, if I have to do things, is to put the accounting as the first changing model. So if we change the rules of accounting, if we change the rules of evaluating companies, which are the key things, and we do integrate the externalities in those rules by rewarding the positive and by taxing the negative, whatever is regenerating biodiversity or uh, capturing carbon, then you will see the difference. Then you will see immediately that some business who are seen as highly profitable are finally not profitable at all. And you have already some comparison today when people start measuring also and valuing the impact of each people. Because at the end, what we're talking about, we're talking about investing or allocating capital with purpose. So purpose to make money, because I would like also to highlight something quite clear is that you cannot do sustainability if you are not profitable. Okay, So you have to be profitable to be able to, so you have to create value. If you do not create value, but what is important is that we can create value, but we can also create value through impact. And we need to measure that. And this is what we have never measured in the past. And this is an additional creation of value that if you monetize it, then you can. If you give a value to nature for what they realize and not destroy, and you reintegrate that in the accounting and the way you measure your performance, then you will see that the decision that human beings will take will be completely different. Thank you so much for your time, Pierre, today. And I'm sure we'll be checking in how Northern France and many of the other projects are going and where finance can play such an important role in this gigantic transition we're in. And again, I want to insist, we are not the one deciding what to do. We are the one facilitating it. Okay, so we provide solution. The real solution is coming on really the scientists and the people who are in the business who want to make those change. And as I mentioned, it could be the off-taker, it could be the farmers, it could be the people in the supply chain. Everybody has a role to play there. And we need to reallocate, we need to rethink about the supply chain model. The supply chain model will change. So we will see different models coming in. There is no one which is better than any other one. There are different models we're starting to be. The contact between the producer and the consumer will be shorter and shorter and will be faster and faster with traceability. And the use of data is key. The use of data is fundamental. It will be the one who create the transparency that we do need in order to believe in the new project and who will give the credibility to the project. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash investingregionag or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.